The Milky Way is not alone. It is surrounded by dozens of diverse galaxies of every color and flavor. Some of them have a disk shape, while others have an elliptical form. Some have striking bright spiral arms, while others appear as indistinct clusters of stars scattered about. Most of these galaxies are slowly drawn together by the gravitational force of our galaxy. However, some have already been torn apart into pieces and devoured by the gigantic disk of the Milky Way. So who are they, our closest galactic neighbors? The discovery of Andromeda. Almost a hundred years ago, we learned that our galaxy is not the entire universe. Edwin Hubble, in 1925, discovered a special type of stars called Cepheids in the so-called Great Spiral Nebula, located in the constellation Andromeda. At that time, astronomers were not certain about the nature of this nebula. Some thought it was part of the Milky Way, one of the places where many new stars are born. Others leaned toward the idea that it was nothing other than a separate galaxy. Since the periods of Cepheid flares correlate with their brightness, Hubble was able to calculate the distance to these stars and realized that Cepheids were too far away to be part of the Milky Way. Thus, the spiral nebula became officially known as the Andromeda Galaxy, our first neighbor. M31, or the Andromeda Galaxy, actually shares many similarities with the Milky Way. Both are spiral galaxies with bridges containing hundreds of billions of stars and disks over 100,000 light years in diameter. Andromeda is slightly larger than the Milky Way, but according to recent research, both galaxies are comparable in mass. In the Northern Hemisphere, Andromeda is the brightest external galaxy and the farthest object in the universe that most people can see with the naked eye. It is located at a distance of 2.5 million light years from us. The Milky Way and Andromeda are part of the local group of galaxies, the largest representatives of this relatively numerous galaxy cluster. Essentially, it's a collection of galaxies of very different shapes and masses, gravitationally bound to each other. The diameter of such a union encompasses approximately 10 million light years. As for the number of galaxies, the search for all members of the local group is ongoing. Currently, there are around 80 known members, but the population of the closest galaxies is uncertain. This is not only because many of them are very small, but also because galaxies must be gravitationally associated with other members of the group, making it challenging to determine. Additionally, our location in the disk of our own galaxy, with dust and stars obscuring much of the interesting parts, complicates matters. So, what do we know about the Triangulum Galaxy? Today, it is known that most galaxies in the local group are satellites of either the Milky Way or Andromeda. Therefore, the local group is often envisioned as two large galaxies with a bunch of tiny neighbors. However, this isn't entirely accurate. The local group is more than just two large galaxies, it consists of three. One of these is the Triangulum Galaxy, or M33, a spiral galaxy. It has a diameter of about 60,000 light years, roughly 60% of the Milky Way's diameter, and it may contain around 40 billion stars. This is two to 10 times fewer stars than in our galaxy. Still, in terms of size and the number of stars, it's a typical spiral galaxy of which there are billions in the universe. Triangulum is located at a distance of 2.7 million light years from us, closer to Andromeda than to the Milky Way. This galaxy is likely a satellite of our largest neighbor, Triangulum Galaxy, or M33, has beautiful spiral arms, indicating that, at least for the past few billion years, the galaxy has largely avoided significant gravitational interactions with its larger neighbor. However, this doesn't mean such interactions didn't occur in the distant past or won't happen in the future. In 2004, astronomers discovered traces of a great hydrogen stream connecting Triangulum with Andromeda. This discovery was confirmed in 2011, suggesting that these galaxies once passed very close to each other, after which Andromeda began to extract precious gas from its smaller companion, this could have happened billions of years ago, since none of the galaxies show signs of tidal disruption. Nevertheless, intense star formation continues in Triangulum, even more so than in Andromeda, roughly 10 times higher. The bright blue spot in the image from the Hubble Space Telescope is the second brightest star-forming region in the local group as a whole. 
It's nearly 100 times larger than the Orion Nebula and contains over 200 hot, massive young stars. Unlike Andromeda and the Milky Way, Triangulum Galaxy appears not to have a massive black hole at its core. Therefore, the three largest galaxies in the local group are spiral galaxies. However, the rest of the group's members cannot boast such a perfect form or large sizes. Dwarf irregular galaxies, as their name suggests, have low mass and lack a specific geometric shape. Visually, they resemble a cluster of stars scattered in various directions and do not exhibit clear spiral arms. If you've ever been in the southern hemisphere, you might have seen them as faint patches in the night sky. If so, you were luckier than me. These galaxies are located at a relatively close distance of only 163,000 and light years from us, respectively. They are undoubtedly gravitationally linked to the Milky Way. For a long time, it was believed that the Magellanic Clouds were satellites of our galaxy. However, observations from the Hubble Space Telescope showed that they are moving too fast to remain in orbit around our galaxy for an extended period. Astronomers do not rule out the possibility that these galaxies may have approached the Milky Way for the first time. The Magellanic Clouds were long considered our closest galactic neighbors. However, in the 1990s, astronomers discovered the dwarf elliptical galaxy Sagittarius Dwarf, which is even closer. It became clear that these two dwarf galaxies were named after the famous explorer Ferdinand Magellan, but of course, he didn't discover them. The Magellanic Clouds were known long before the voyages of the Great Navigator and were an integral part of the culture of indigenous peoples in South America, Australia, and South Africa. The peculiar shape of these two galaxies is likely due to gravitational interactions with the Milky Way. During their closest approach, our galaxy could have disrupted the original form of the Magellanic Clouds, which, by the way, might have been spiral galaxies themselves. In response, the two galaxies somewhat distorted the outer part of our galaxy's disk. Such interactions not only affect the shape of smaller galaxies, but gradually strip them of the gas needed for star formation. The massive stream of gas moving from the smaller galaxies towards the Milky Way is known as the Magellanic Stream. We can't see it with the naked eye, but it is well observed in the radio spectrum. This enormous cloud extends across a quarter of the Earth's sky, and astronomers have been fortunate to observe it up close. This proximity allows them to better understand how gas circulates between galaxies. Although the Large Magellanic Cloud is depleting its fuel, new stars are born intensely in the galaxy. The Tarantula Nebula, which James Webb recently captured, is the largest and brightest star-forming region in the local group. It has a total mass of about a million solar masses and a diameter of 550 light years. Within this nebula are the hottest and most massive known stars. By the way, the brightest recorded supernova in the last 400 years happened in the vicinity of the Tarantula Nebula in 1604 within the Milky Way and was described by Johannes Kepler. Next, among our galaxy's interesting neighbors, we can consider the dwarf galaxy NGC 6744, also known as the Pump 2. Don't be surprised by the name, it refers to a constellation in the southern hemisphere of the sky where the galaxy was discovered. The constellation itself got its name from the air pump constructed by French inventor Denis Papin in the 17th century. So the Pump 2 is one of the recently discovered satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Astronomers noticed it in 2018 using data from the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft. This dwarf elliptical galaxy is not only intriguing because of its name, it is similar in size to the Large Magellanic Cloud, but about 10,000 times fainter. In fact, it has the lowest brightness of all known galaxies in the universe. It's no wonder astronomers didn't spot it for a long time. Additionally, this galaxy is located in what's called the Zone of Avoidance, hidden behind the disk of the Milky Way. This region is filled with bright stars and interstellar dust, making observations quite challenging. Today astronomers are still uncertain about how this galaxy, referred to as a ghost galaxy, could have formed. One of the plausible scenarios scientists consider is a tidal disruption. In this scenario, 
the gravitational force of the Milky Way stretched the galaxy to its current size and extracted about 90% of its stars in some way. It seems that Pump 2 is moving towards us, and in a few billion years, it might become part of our galaxy. However, the dwarf elliptical galaxy Sagittarius has been lucky to have so much time. For instance, it has interacted with the Milky Way three times. This remarkable galaxy has a somewhat unique shape. It forms a loop. This is because during each of its approaches to the Milky Way, tidal forces have torn it apart, resulting in a galaxy that continues its movement around the Milky Way, with threads of stars trailing behind it. This complex but undoubtedly impressive ring-like structure was first discovered in 1994. Its discovery reshuffled the Magellanic Clouds from the top of the list of the nearest galaxies to the Milky Way. The core of Sagittarius is now just 50,000 light-years away from the center of our galaxy. An intriguing hypothesis suggests that Sagittarius might have had a direct impact not only on the galaxy's disk, but also on our solar system. According to this research, the three encounters between Sagittarius and the Milky Way significantly stimulated star formation in the larger galaxy. Using data from the mentioned space probe, astronomers have determined that our galaxy underwent at least three periods of intense star birth. These occurred around six, two, and one billion years ago. Interestingly, these periods of increased star birth seem to correspond to when the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy passed through the disk of the Milky Way. Scientists believe that these encounters caused disturbances in interstellar dust and gas at that time, relative to the otherwise calm galaxy, led to an increase in the density of matter in certain parts of our galaxy, which, of course, triggered the birth of stars. According to astronomers' research, a significant portion of the stellar mass in the Milky Way formed thanks to Sagittarius, and without it, this component would simply not exist. What's particularly intriguing is that the solar system formed approximately when the dwarf galaxy Sagittarius first dived into our galaxy's disk. It's undoubtedly challenging to pinpoint the exact reasons why the cloud of gas and dust that gave birth to the Sun began to dissipate. Still, Sagittarius' involvement in this process cannot be ruled out. Who knows whether our planet would exist today if the Milky Way hadn't attracted yet another small neighbor billions of years ago. Another interesting aspect is the absorbed Gaia Enceladus galaxy. When astronomers find evidence of past collisions directly in our galaxy's disk, the speed and direction of motion of Milky Way stars help uncover its turbulent history. In 2018, using data from the Gaia space probe, which collected information over 20 months, astronomers were able to investigate the motion and brightness of around 7 million stars in our galaxy. Among them, 30,000 stars appeared to form a distinct group, moving along elongated trajectories and in the opposite direction to most of the galaxy's hundreds of billions of stars, including the Sun. Astronomers suspected that these 30,000 stars were not born in our galaxy, but could be remnants of a separate galaxy that was absorbed by the Milky Way in the distant past. Therefore, scientists decided to test their hypothesis and studied the chemical composition of these peculiar stars. In the distant past, scientists decided to test their hypothesis and examine the chemical composition of these peculiar stars. It's worth noting that stars forming in different galaxies have a unique chemical composition that corresponds to the conditions of their home galaxies. For instance, stars in the Magellanic Clouds have lower metallicity than the stars in the Milky Way. Astronomers refer to all chemical elements heavier than helium as metals, and the abundance of metals in galaxies increases over time, especially in galaxies with active star formation. This is because metals are primarily synthesized in stars, which act as factories for producing chemical elements. On average, larger galaxies have higher metallicity than smaller ones. Returning to this extraordinary collection of stars, astronomers determined that they indeed have a slightly different chemical composition, distinguishing them from most stars in the Milky Way. Thus, there's almost no doubt that they belong to another galaxy that collided with ours approximately 10 billion years ago. Scientists named this galaxy Gaia Enceladus. Further observations helped identify a total of 13 globular clusters in the Milky Way, 
future mergers that move along similar trajectories to the stars in Gaia Enceladus. Therefore, it appears that these clusters are also part of the absorbed galaxy. Globular clusters consist of up to a million stars held together by mutual gravitational attraction, forming a well-defined spherical shape that revolves around the center of their parent galaxy. The fact that so many globular clusters are associated with the absorbed galaxy serves as evidence that Gaia Enceladus was once a truly massive galaxy, even surrounded by its own globular clusters. Researchers determined that this galaxy could have been roughly the size of the Large Magellanic Cloud, but 10 billion years ago, the Milky Way was not significantly larger than it is now, possibly only about four times larger than the Small Magellanic Cloud. Therefore, their collision likely had a very substantial impact on our galaxy and essentially shaped its current structure. It seems that something similar is currently happening to the Magellanic Clouds. In 2018, a group of astronomers examined the movement of more than 300 stars in the smaller of the two galaxies using a space apparatus. This mission, which was quite impressive in itself, pushed our understanding of local space to new heights. Imagine how much more comprehensive projects like the Vera Rubin Observatory will contribute to our knowledge. So, scientists observe that stars in the southeastern part of the small Magellanic Cloud are moving away from the main part of the galaxy towards its larger sibling. Computer models show that these two galaxies likely collided head-on several hundred million years ago. Therefore, it appears that they are currently in the process of merging, and in the next million years, they will continue to collide with each other repeatedly until they eventually merge into a single galaxy. However, the main collision in the local group will occur a bit later. You may know that Andromeda is heading towards our galaxy, and in slightly less than 4 billion years, they will first approach each other. Powerful tidal forces will distort both galaxies, transforming their ordered disks into chaotic bursts of gas and stars. In another 2-3 to three billion years, they will finally merge into one giant elliptical galaxy, which astronomers have named Milcometa. Triangulum, on the other hand, will likely continue to orbit the merged galaxy for a long time before becoming part of it. The rest of the galaxies in the local group will not escape a similar fate, although this will take tens of billions of years. Therefore, it seems that astronomers have billions of years at their disposal to better understand the local group, find all our galactic neighbors, and gain insight into how galaxies form, live, and interact with each other. This knowledge will serve as the foundation for understanding the universe as a whole. Andromeda Galaxy is perhaps the most well-known galaxy to the general public, excluding the galaxy we live in. This galaxy is frequently featured in science fiction works more than any other galaxy. This is not surprising because it is the largest galaxy closest to Earth. It takes about 2.5 million light years to reach the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a surprising number for us, but a trivial distance in terms of the universe. The Andromeda Galaxy is one of the few galaxies visible to the naked eye. Therefore, its existence has been known for a long time. However, its structure cannot be seen due to the fact that it is very far away. Therefore, in medieval literature it was depicted as a small cloud floating in the night sky. Even with the invention of telescopes, this problem could not be solved. Early telescopes were very primitive, so individual stars in the Andromeda galaxy could not be distinguished. Some nebulae were discovered in the Milky Way, and the protagonist of this video was also considered one of those nebulae. The original name given to this galaxy was the Andromeda Nebula, due to such circumstances. In 1855, scientists noticed an explosion that occurred in the Andromeda Galaxy. It was probably a very bright supernova, but it was considered simply a new star starting to burn. The fact that a star begins to burn inside a cradle of stars, known as a nebula, was already known at that time. Therefore, this distant galaxy is constantly expanding. The misconception that common nebulae are impossible to understand seems to be deepening. It was only towards the end of the 19th century, when the telescope had been improved, that we were able to barely recognize the structures of whirlpool arms in the Andromeda galaxy and bright nebulae.
This was also around the time when a faint voice first suggested that what we were building was not a nebula, but another galaxy, like the Milky Way. However, at the time, the single galaxy model was dominant, and most scientists thought that the Milky Way was the entire universe. It should be noted that in the mid-19th century, there was a claim that the Magellanic Clouds were other galaxies, but many people denied it for the same reasons. To defend the scientists of the time, their reaction was not simply due to rigid thinking. At the time, astronomers did not have the ability to measure distances to distant celestial bodies as accurately as we do now. For example, in the case of the Andromeda Galaxy, various researchers estimated the distance to be closer to Polaris than the North Pole. Although it emits thousands of light years away, it is still too close. Finally, in 1923, the great Edwin Hubble succeeded in using the latest telescope of the time to discover several Cepheid variables in the Andromeda Galaxy. Cepheid variables are a type of bright yellow variable star that has the characteristic of always changing its brightness with the same period, even though it is the same star. There is a formula for deriving the distance to a star by substituting the apparent brightness and actual brightness of the star. Cepheid variables are the easiest type of variable star to improve. When Hubble improved the distance to the Cepheid variables in the Andromeda galaxy, he realized that it couldn't exist in the Galaxy 1 group. Even the boldest of the past calculations turned out to be wrong. The distance was over 2.5 million light years. In this way, the scale of the universe known to humanity has expanded many times beyond the galaxy. As a result, the scale of the universe known to humankind expanded enormously. Other celestial bodies, such as the Magellanic Clouds, were also confirmed to exist beyond our galaxy by Hubble. Andromeda Galaxy was the first to be identified as a galaxy. As research progressed, we learned many new and interesting facts about the Andromeda Galaxy. For example, we learned that this galaxy is much larger than our own Milky Way, with a diameter of over 45,000 parsecs and containing at least first magnitude stars. The largest galaxy in our local group is the Andromeda Galaxy, followed by the Milky Way. Like the galaxy, Andromeda has a distinct disk and several spiral arms, most of the countless stars that belong to the Andromeda Galaxy are included in this disk. The center of the galaxy contains the galactic nucleus. Interestingly, the galactic nucleus appears to be double. Even in photographs, two distinct structures, one large and one small, separated by about five light years, can be clearly identified. The structure on the dimmer side is called P2, and it is believed to be the true center of the Andromeda Galaxy. There is a supermassive black hole at this location, but its mass has not yet been fully determined. Estimates suggest that it may be tens of millions or even billions of times more massive than the Sun. For reference, the supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy has a mass of only about 4.3 million suns. The larger and brighter structure located slightly away from the center of the galaxy is called P1. However, it is currently unclear what this structure is. Perhaps, from an astronomical perspective, relatively recently, the Andromeda Galaxy may have consumed another galaxy, and that galaxy has not yet been completely digested. If that is the case, P1 may be the remnant of the disrupted galaxy. Even those who have never heard of it before may not know that galaxies sometimes swallow other galaxies. Andromeda is particularly interesting in this regard, as one of the highlights is the globular cluster called Myel-2, which is located 130,000 light-years away from the galaxy's center. Myel-2, discovered in 1953, is known as the brightest star cluster in our local galaxy group. Usually, globular clusters are composed of very old dim stars that were born at a similar time. However, Myel-2 is more interesting because it contains a variety of age groups of stars, including some that are much younger. Stars with a high metal content also exist there probably isn't any life in the Amai star cluster. In the globular cluster, stars are always in planetary system shapes because they are densely packed. Nevertheless, rare shapes are clearly visible in the Andromeda galaxy that are smaller than formal galaxies, including dwarf galaxies. These structures have a spherical shape, a very large radius, and contain a large number of stars. Perhaps, like Mayway 2, they are remnants of swallowed galaxies. 
In 1999, scientists recorded an anomalous phenomenon called PA9 in the Andromeda Galaxy. During this process, the fusion of an old red giant star, one of the observed low-mass celestial bodies, was caused. There are several interpretations for this phenomenon. Some scientists believe that this mysterious celestial body could be a planet with a mass of about six times that of Jupiter. If their view is correct, this would be the first extraterrestrial planet discovered in another galaxy. However, other astronomers argue that the object involved in this phenomenon is not a planet, but a small star. In any case, there will be many planets in the Andromeda galaxy, including those similar to Earth. In this galaxy, there are very old stars and very young stars, and the stars are clearly divided into three generations, accounting for most of the population of the galaxy when combined. Scientists paid attention to this point immediately. The age of these stars ranges from 10 billion to 11 billion years, respectively. Of course, what we are most interested in is the second star that corresponds to the Sun. There are enough of such stars remaining in the Andromeda galaxy, so surely many extraterrestrials will be discovered. If there are any intelligent beings or humans that still exist in the Andromeda galaxy in tens of billions of years, they may come to meet us without even having to show off their technological skills. However, the problem is that the two galaxies are slowly approaching each other and will collide and merge four billion years from now to become one galaxy. But there won't be any major cataclysms on the scale of the Earth. The distance between the stars is quite wide, and even if aliens interfere between us and Proxima Centauri, there won't be any significant harm. Space is a place of frighteningly vast distances. Just the thought that incredibly fast light takes 13 billion years to reach us from some galaxy can make one feel uneasy. But if we focus on the positive, the distance between us and Mars, just a dozen or so light minutes away, seems like a hop in space terms. And there are times when our cosmic neighbors seem incredibly close. Even the four light years to Alpha Centauri don't look scary compared to distant galaxies. It's insanely close, and there's no doubt that humanity will eventually reach our solar system's cosmic neighbors. But who are they, apart from Alpha Centauri? Few would name the stars neighboring our sun, but don't worry, we'll cover that in the next couple of minutes, and also estimate how far away they are. Before we talk about the chances of finding life on our cosmic neighbors, let's first discuss how scientists can determine which stars in the sky are close to us and which are far away, and how they can be sure they're not mistaken. The concept of a parsec, which you've probably heard of from science fiction, is a unit of measurement that was introduced thanks to the use of parallax. The prefix par means parallel, and sec stands for sector of gas, which is, of course, a joke. The actual meaning of acer is arc second, thanks to which we can use Apple devices to experience parallax in a simplified way. In fact, with the release of the iPhone 7, Apple introduced a new type of wallpaper that creates the illusion of depth when the phone is moved, simulating the effect of parallax. The term symbolizes the change in the apparent position of an object, depending on the position of the observer. Try holding up your finger and closing your left eye while looking at it with your right eye. Then, quickly close your right eye and open your left eye. You should see your finger appear to jump to the side. This is the same principle that scientists use to measure the distance to nearby stars. If you move your finger closer to your eyes and repeat the procedure, you will see that it has shifted more than before. If you draw imaginary lines to your finger, you will get a triangle, one side of which you know well, the distance between your eyes. The two angles at which the eyes are looking at the finger are also known, and finding the length of the remaining side, which will be the distance to the finger, is a matter of time. And now, put reason and great scientists, whole generations of hard work and huge formulas on this scheme, and you will get a method according to which the distance to the objects was calculated with excellent accuracy. Distances to thousands of stars and even to the planets of our solar system, as well as the sun itself, were initially determined using the parallax method. 
This method is based on observing how their position changes against more distant objects when viewed from different points or as the Earth rotates. It is not difficult to guess that objects that are too far away cannot be calculated using the parallax method since we are limited by the diameter of the Earth. Even when viewed from both ends of the planet or during a complete rotation, the displacement of distant stars will be negligible. Other methods are used for those objects. But what we are interested in are the nearest neighbors of the solar system, which can be reached by simple parallax and later refined using more accurate methods. It should be noted that even 10 light years is a huge distance. The distance is too great for us to judge the number of neighboring stars definitively. In order to determine the distance to something, you need to see it first, and among the stars, there are very dim brown dwarfs. Therefore, the question of a precise number of our nearest neighbors remains open at the moment. With brown dwarfs taken into account, it is estimated that there are 14 large neighboring stars at a distance of 10 light years from our solar system. Let's start our story with a tiny red dwarf, standing at a height of 154. If we were to send light directly towards it, it would take about 9 and 69 hundredths years to reach it, which is amazing. At least we know that this star is still alive, unlike some fairy dish that sent its light to us about 6,000 years ago. We see it as it was when the ancient Egyptians were building the Pyramid of Cheops. So what can we say about Rho 154? Not much. It's a very typical star, as red dwarfs make up more than half of the stars in the galaxy. Rho 154 is five times smaller than the Sun in mass, and 300 times dimmer in brightness, and is located in the constellation Sagittarius. Despite its proximity to Earth, it cannot be seen with the naked eye. Interestingly, 154 is characterized by intense X-ray radiation, which is greater than that of the Sun. This can be explained by the star's relative youth, as it is less than a billion years old. At the time of its formation, there were already algae on Earth. However, due to its proximity to the Sun, the star falls into the first category of astronomers' attention. Searching for proplanets around stars is incredibly difficult because they are very dim compared to stars, and 154's height itself is not particularly bright, plus it is close. At one point, one of NASA's missions was very interested in studying this star, because, theoretically, we could find a planet there that is three times the size of Earth. However, unfortunately, funding was not obtained, and there wasn't much reason for the planet, which would need to have Earth-like conditions, to be located four times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. Its orbit would be blocked, and the hypothetical Earth-like planet around 154 would always be facing one side, receiving too much X-ray radiation and too little red light for photosynthesis. Therefore, even theoretically, finding habitable planets around red dwarfs like 154 is extremely challenging. We don't really have anything to do with our lives, but our theories are still based on the Earth, so let's talk about Sirius instead. You don't need to get to know it twice, it's the brightest star in the night sky. If you put the Sun and Sirius at the same distance, Sirius will be 25 times brighter than our star. However, we shouldn't be deceived. There are much brighter stars in space in absolute terms than Sirius. For example, Rigel's luminosity is about 120,000 higher than the Sun's. If you were to switch places between Rigel and Sirius in the night sky, Rigel would shine like a third of the moon. Nevertheless, Sirius is still a bright star. It is roughly twice as heavy as the Sun and almost twice as large as the Earth, so it has been known to humans since ancient times. It was worshipped in ancient Egypt, Babylon, and Greece, and that's where it all started. The name Sirius, which translates as shining, also refers to its location in the constellation Canis Major. According to legend, Sirius is the dog of Orion. The Romans even translated the star's name as Canicula, meaning little dog, because its morning visibility coincided with hot days, which later became known as dog days, thanks to the star. Now, the word vacation is associated with the meaning of the word canicula, and schoolchildren all over the planet are happy to have it. What is this neighbor, located just 8.5 light years away from us? Sirius is a great star of spectral class A1, and it has a tiny white dwarf companion, Sirius B, 
which astronomers jokingly call the puppy. This is really the case because Sirius B is 360 times dimmer than the Sun. However, it should be noted that there are much brighter stars in space than Sirius in absolute terms. For example, Rigel's brightness is about 120,000 times higher than that of the Sun. Puppy is still well fed and in terms of mass, it is not inferior to our Sun, being one of the largest white dwarfs. However, this does not make the Sirius system particularly unique. As we discussed in the previous video, there is every reason to believe that systems with two stars are more common in space than single stars, and our introverted sun is a typical resident of the universe. If there is potential for life in this system from our point of view, then a terrestrial planet and conditions for liquid water would need to be located far from Sirius, as far as Jupiter is from the sun, which is four times farther than the Earth is now. The year would last about six years, which is not the worst thing, but the worst is that Sirius emits much more ultraviolet radiation than the Sun. It is possible to forget, and therefore there are questions about ordinary free oxygen, and the weight of the Sirius puppy will also affect the orbit, and therefore the stability of conditions on the planet. In general, everything is very bad, and from the point of view of real research, even worse. Sirius is very bright, and despite its proximity to the Sun, it is very difficult to find a planet near it. Current scientific achievements allow us, in theory, to find only a planet with a mass of 510 Jupiters at a distance of 25 times farther than the Earth from the Sun. In 2008, such a test was conducted, and the result was predictable, negative. Some scientists still believe that Sirius is not a binary triple star, and we still cannot conclusively refute them, Hubble tried to find more. Hubble tried to find another brown dwarf, or some huge Jupiter, but he could not, although the theoretical calculations as a whole allow for the possibility of stable orbits within the system. Perhaps in the near future, we will study Sirius better, as it slowly approaches the Earth, and in the next few tens of thousands of years, it will shine even brighter. However, the distance will increase again, but we can say for sure that for another couple of hundred thousand years, Sirius will be the brightest star in the sky, unlike our next neighbors. Wolf 359 is insanely dim red dwarf. It is closer to us than Sirius and is located 7.8 light years from the sun, but much dimmer. It is impossible to see a planet with the naked eye in the sky. If we were to switch our sun to Wolf 359, then Earth's round shape would disappear. Without a telescope, it wouldn't be visible and during the day it would be 10 times brighter than during a full moon on Wolfie 359. We wouldn't have stopped if it weren't for its high cavity in two directions. The first reason is the potential presence of two exoplanets. In 2019, a team of astronomers led by Mig Kotlami published a study announcing two candidates for exoplanets in the Wolf 359 system. The first planet is 20 to 40 times larger than Earth and rotates twice as far away. The second planet is allegedly only four times larger than our planet and is located close to the star, close enough to allow the possibility of life. However, scientists quickly cooled their enthusiasm, as the amount of radiation that this hypothetical planet would receive would be many times greater than Earth's, making the existence of life unlikely. The planets themselves are still only candidates, as direct observation and confirmation of their existence is difficult. But scientists remain interested in Wolf 359 for two reasons. First, this star is located near the plane of the ecliptic, which means that if you were to look at the Sun from the Wolf 359 system, all the planets of the solar system would be visible at once. Hypothetically, if advanced aliens have scattered probes throughout the universe for scanning, then a probe on Wolfie 359 could easily discover the existence of Earth. And in turn, by observing Wolfie 359, we may find a hypothetical probe studying us. Of course, these searches have not led to anything yet. Much more productive to scientists is the legendary star Barnard, another neighbor of our sun. It is the second closest object of its type to us, or the fourth, if you count Alpha Centauri, which is a triple star system. Firstly, it is important to know how fast Barnard's star is, it approaches us so quickly that it creates the impression that it owed the sun a hundred kilometers, except for the sun itself, 
It is the fastest star in the sky, flying towards us at a speed of 110 kilometers per second. And if now Barnard's star is somewhere six light years away, then in 11,000 years of our era, the distance will be reduced by a third and will already be equal to three whole light years. By cosmic standards, this is insanely fast. We see it as it was at the time when the construction of the Pyramid of Khufu in ancient Egypt had not yet begun. There is not much interesting to say about its height of 154, as it is a very typical star, since red dwarfs make up more than half of the stars in the galaxy. Its height is five times smaller than that of the Sun, and its brightness is 300 times less. It is located in the constellation Sagittarius and, despite its proximity to Earth, it cannot be seen with the naked eye. The only notable thing about its height of 154 is the incredibly intense X-ray radiation it emits, which is more than that of the Sun. This can be explained by the star's relative youth, which is less than a billion years old. When it was formed, there were already algae on Earth, but because of its proximity to the Sun, the star is among the brightest in the sky. In addition, it has X-ray radiation and is a bit lazy and slow-moving old guy, but this doesn't negate the fact that the temperature on the surface of this star, belonging to the red dwarf Barnard, is almost 3,000 degrees. It's worth respecting at least because, due to its proximity, it has become almost a standard in studying stars of this type. It's quite difficult to study them because they are dim and heavy, but it's slightly easier to search for planets than it used to be. Peter van de Kamp announced the discovery of two planets orbiting Barnard's star in 1960. The first planet was similar in mass to Jupiter, while the second was only half as large. However, Peter couldn't find confirmation of his discovery, even though he tried very hard. The Hubble telescope helped to clarify that planets with a mass greater than five Earths cannot orbit Barnard's star. It seemed that there was no hope left, but in 2018, an international team of astronomers announced that they had found a planet about three times the size of Earth, orbiting Barnard's star at more than twice the distance that Earth orbits the Sun. However, despite the accuracy of the calculations, Barnard's planet B still remains a candidate, although its existence was also confirmed in 2021. Furthermore, most astronomers give a 90% chance of potential life on a potential exoplanet, However, even if the planet is twice as close to its star as Earth is to the Sun, it will receive extremely little heat due to the coolness of the star. Sometimes the temperature on a hypothetical exoplanet is unlikely to be higher than minus 170 degrees. In general, the prospects for life are bleak with the other neighbors of Earth that have potential for life. However, the mighty system of Alpha Centauri, consisting of three stars, comes onto the scene located about four light years away from the Sun. Two of the three stars in Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, are of great interest as they are very similar to our Sun. Alpha Centauri a shines one and a half times brighter and is slightly larger than our Sun, while Alpha Centauri B is slightly smaller than the Sun and shines half as much. The entire Alpha Centauri system is slightly older than the Sun, and visually the two large stars merge into one when observed from Earth. This is not surprising, since they orbit each other at an average distance of only 24 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. If the Sun were replaced with another star, in moments of closest approach, the star would be separated by a distance equal to that between the Sun and Saturn. The third member of the star system, Proxima Centauri, is a true runt. It is only one and a half times larger than Jupiter and is a red dwarf. Even Barnard's star looks like a giant against its background. Proxima Centauri is also actively studied, but it is the two older sisters, Alpha Centauri A and B, that really excite scientists. They have been studied extensively, even peering into their atmospheres and finding similarities to the Sun and conducting some of the most precise calculations of possible planetary and life presence. Many simulations were conducted, and they conclusively ruled out the presence of giant planets. This is not surprising since two of the three stars are so close together, and Jupiter would face a sad fate between their gravitational influence. However, simulations showed that both stars have a so-called habitable zone, 
which is an orbit where theoretically stable planets with liquid water can exist. Unfortunately, due to the brightness of the stars, even taking into account the insane proximity of the Alpha Centauri system, it is difficult to say anything. In 2012, European astronomers claimed to have found an exoplanet around Alpha Centauri b, but its existence was disproved three years later. The situation is slightly better for the larger star, Alpha Centauri a. In February 2021, a candidate exoplanet was found there that is remarkably similar in size and orbit to Earth. It will be verified by the James Webb Telescope, and we still have yet to learn the outcome. However, the true king in this scenario is quite unexpected. In the search for life, the collapse of the Proxima Centauri system is not surprising on the one hand, as we mentioned before, it is slightly easier to find planets around dim stars. However, the exoplanet discovered there in 2016 is astonishing. It is also almost identical in size to Earth, but its year lasts only 11 days, which means it is much closer to the star. Considering that Proxima Centauri is a dim star, this is an ideal combination of factors. The exoplanet candidate receives 65% of the Earth's warmth, which theoretically opens the doors to the existence of liquid water. However, more recent calculations are less optimistic due to the proximity to the star. Potential Earth-20 receives an indecent amount of radiation, and since Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, it periodically experiences powerful flares. For example, in 2017, a flare was recorded that according to scientists' data, would have certainly killed the planet. All your life on a planet, even if one existed, is not so bad. There are several candidates for exoplanets in the Alpha Centauri system, some of which are also in the habitable zone. There is hope that the James Webb Telescope will help confirm or refute this data, but of course Alpha Centauri is the main candidate for all organizations that aim for interstellar travel. There is, of course, the Project Daedalus, which aimed at the Barnard Star, but this is rather an exception because scientists mostly dream about Alpha Centauri and here dreams come up against harsh reality. Humanity has exactly one spacecraft that shows signs of life outside the solar system, Voyager 1, which was launched in 1977 and was actually designed for five years. It miraculously stayed on track and in 2012 entered interstellar space, but even it will not approach another star for 40,000 years, although it is not about Alpha Centauri. Voyager is heading in a different direction, as are the New Horizons and Pioneer 10 spacecraft. Their missions, like Voyager, were mainly focused on the inner part of the solar system. Specifically, nobody has sent anything to other stars yet. However, if Voyager had been turned around at the same speed and sent to Proxima Centauri, it would have reached it in 76,000 years. And mind you, this is one of the fastest spacecrafts in human history. Of course, there is also the Helios 2 probe, which was accelerated using the gravitational pull of the sun to an indecent speed of 240,000 kilometers per hour. But even with this speed, it would take 19,000 years to travel four light years. There was a prototype electromagnetic engine from NASA that went even faster during testing. But even for it, it would take 13,000 years to fly to Proxima Centauri. Nuclear and thermonuclear reactor projects do not help much, they are either too dangerous, too expensive, or too slow. The laser sail technology is considered the most promising in the near future. According to this technology, a sail is deployed around the ship, just like in the old days, and solar radiation accelerates it for greater speed. This sail is pushed by lasers, and according to Robert Frisbee's calculations, it could reach Alpha Centauri in 12 years. However, for this to happen, its diameter must be a paltry 320 kilometers, and the useful payload would be a canned food tin and a tennis racket. And there is also antimatter, engines powered by which can be incredibly efficient. However, the production of one gram of antimatter would cost several trillion dollars. Overall, the situation with interstellar travel is very sad. Either the necessary technologies don't exist yet, or they are just concepts or they are too expensive, considering that interstellar travel has little practical value. It's clear that most scientists are focused on solving everyday problems. The bright spot on this background and hope for our generation is the Dragonfly Project, 
which involves sending a very tiny sailcraft to Alpha Centauri. The goal of the project is to reach the star within one generation, but for now, it's just a concept. Strictly speaking, we need to study our own solar system better, and until we finally figure out Mars and potentially habitable moons of Jupiter, looking towards Sirius and Barnard's star is premature. Absolutely all galaxies, except for our own, are extremely distant astronomical objects. We will never truly know what happens in these immense gravitationally bound systems and the stars within them. Unfortunately, I will never have the chance to visit them. We can't send an umbrella or any device there. We won't know if there is life or wondrous forms of life. The universe, unfortunately, has taken away that possibility from us because colossal distances separate us. Galaxies are scattered throughout the entire universe. Nevertheless, we are grateful since one of these galaxies once gave us life, and now we observe them since time immemorial. Each of the galaxies is currently living its own life cycle. They collide, merge with others, evolve in their unique way, die, and are reborn. Each of them is distinct and peculiar. Almost everything you know about objects in the universe, planets, stars, moons, nebulae, is located within galaxies. They have become a peculiar haven for everything. To start, it's worth noting that the, num the number of galaxies in the observable universe is genuinely unknown. However, with the naked eye, we can see four whole galaxies in the sky. They are the Andromeda Galaxy, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, and the M33 Galaxy in the Triangulum Constellation. But despite being able to see the contours of galaxies clearly in the sky or in photographs, in reality, galaxies do not have clear boundaries. It is not possible to precisely determine where the galaxy ends and intergalactic space begins. In the optical range, a galaxy may appear to have a certain size, but when measured using radio observations of interstellar gas, its radius can turn out to be much larger, and this is not uncommon. Typically, the size of a galaxy is understood as the photometric size, which is represented as a certain curve on its illuminated surface, connecting points of equal brightness. The measured mass of a galaxy will depend on its size. Firstly, there is the core. The core is a small region at the center of the galaxy. When we talk about galaxy cores, we often refer to active galactic nuclei, where processes cannot be explained by the properties of stars concentrated in them. In such cores, processes occur that release an enormous amount of energy. Common signs of activity in these cores include the ejection of ionized gas or high-powered radio emission, though not always. Often, the unusual behavior of active galactic nuclei is associated with supermassive black holes, and currently, this is the most widely accepted theory. The second component is the galactic disk. The galactic disk is a relatively thin layer where most of the galaxy's objects are found. It is a component in the lens of visible and spiral galaxies containing spiral arms. The disk predominantly contains younger stars compared to the galactic bulge, and their motion is well-ordered. They revolve around the center of the galaxy in nearly circular orbits lying in the same plane. Galaxies have a high density compared to their surrounding physical components, like the halo or bulge, which are populated with older stars. In the disks of galaxies, often, spiral arms can be observed, radiating from the center of the galaxy, where the density of interstellar gas and young stars is particularly high. It is within such a spiral arm that we live. Next, let's talk about the so-called galactic halo, a term used in astrophysics. The galactic halo is an invisible component of a galaxy and is hypothetical in nature. Essentially, the galactic halo is the outermost part of the galaxy that greatly interests scientists, as studying it can help understand where the gravitational influence of one galaxy ends and another begins. Another galactic component is quite rare and is known as the polar ring. For example, the galaxy NGC 465A has this component. In the classical case, a galaxy with a polar ring has two disks rotating in perpendicular planes, with the centers of these disks coinciding. However, the exact cause of the formation of polar rings remains incompletely understood. Galaxies with polar rings are a type of galaxies where an outer ring of gas and stars rotates over the poles, and these polar rings are believed to form when two galaxies interact gravitationally with each other. The next galactic component is called the bulge. 
It is a central bright elliptical component of spiral and lens-shaped galaxies. It mainly consists of old stars moving on elongated orbits. The typical population of the bulge includes red giants, red dwarfs, or supernova, two types, as well as variable stars like cepheids or globular clusters. For example, in typical lens-shaped galaxies, the bulge is larger relative to the galaxy's diameter compared to spiral galaxies. In my opinion, the bulge is one of the most interesting elements in the structure of galaxies. Now let's talk about the bar, or in layman's terms, the bridge. It looks like a dense and elongated formation consisting of stars and interstellar gas. It serves as the primary supplier of interstellar gas to the center of the galaxy. With this knowledge of the necessary components, we can now move on to classifying galaxies and learn more about these stellar islands. There are different classifications of galaxies, such as the Hubble classification or classifications based on infrared telescopes, elliptical galaxies. Approximately 25% of all known galaxies are of this type. They are highly luminous and from a distance appear like giant shining spheres with the highest brightness at the center and fading towards the edges. Elliptical galaxies are nearly entirely composed of old stars, giving them a yellow or reddish hue. New stars are almost not formed in them since the amount of interstellar gas and dust in them is negligible, although there are occasional exceptions. Elliptical stellar systems differ only in size and compression. They are classified based on their compression with letters E from 0 to 7. This number corresponds to the degree of flattening of the system. For example, E0 would be a spherical cluster, while E6 would be much more flattened. Moreover, according to the classification, an E0 galaxy can be perfectly round, while an E7 galaxy can be oval-shaped. The star formation in galaxies of this type has ceased for several billion years, and there is hardly any cold gas or cosmic dust left. Most massive galaxies are filled with very sparse hot gas with temperatures over 1 million kelvins. On the other hand, in spiral galaxies, star formation occurs more uniformly. Therefore, the most massive stars in elliptical galaxies have long completed their existence, while in spiral galaxies, new stars are constantly being formed and observed. One of the most common examples of an elliptical galaxy is M87. Spiral galaxies are the most widespread type and probably the most beautiful. They constitute more than half of all known galaxies. A spiral galaxy appears as a disk with a bright yellow ball in the center, around which spiral arms are coiled. These arms consist of fainter branches with a bluish tint due to the presence of specific stars, such as white and blue supergiants. In contrast to elliptical stellar systems, they possess several distinctive structural features. Spiral galaxies have spiral arms where active star formation processes occur. They have a stellar disk, which is a relatively thin layer of matter along the galaxy's plane, where the main mass of objects in the system and stars is located. Stars within the disk rotate around the center of the galaxy. In spiral galaxies, the presence of interstellar gas and dust, essential for star formation, is widely observed. Many spiral galaxies have a peculiar structure at their center, known as a bar, from which the spiral arms extend. They are classified with the letter S and differ in the density of arm placement. Typically, these galaxies have two or three arms, although in some cases, the arms may vary in size. All of these arms, unless influenced by galactic collisions, are coiled in the same direction around the center of the galaxy, where most of the matter is concentrated, such as a supermassive black hole and dense spherical clusters of old stars, known as bulge. For instance, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and the Andromeda galaxy, which we will inevitably collide with in about 4 billion years, are both spiral galaxies. The Sun is located between the arms, away from the galactic center, and its velocity of movement is approximately equal to the rotation speed of the arms. This positioning allows the solar system to avoid dangerous regions of active star formation where supernovae often occur. It is worth noting that spiral galaxies are often observed beyond galaxy clusters. They differ in the degree of development of their spiral structure, which is denoted by adding letters A, B, or C to the S symbol. Galaxies with A have the main number of stars concentrated in a central bulge, while the central branches of the spiral structure are weakly developed or just indicated. In galaxies with B, 
the branches are more developed, and for those classified as C, the branches are well developed in galaxies classified as C. The main number of stars is contained in heavily developed and often scattered branches, while the central bulge has relatively small dimensions. The most well-known spiral galaxies include our Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Bode's galaxy. An intermediate type between spiral and elliptical galaxies is the lenticular galaxies, classified as S0. In galaxies of this type, there is a bright, highly compressed central bulge that resembles a lens, while the arms are either absent or very weakly traced. Lenticular galaxies primarily consist of old giant stars, giving them a predominantly reddish color. They differ from elliptical galaxies because they have convexity and a thin disk, but they are distinct from type C because they lack a spiral structure. The main population of such galaxies comprises old and massive stars, mostly of red and yellow colors. Two-thirds of the lenticular galaxies, like elliptical galaxies, do not contain gas, while in one-third, the gas content is similar to that of spiral galaxies. Consequently, star formation processes, though present, occur at very slow rates. An example of a lenticular galaxy is the Spindle Galaxy in the constellation Draco. More interesting are the so-called irregular galaxies, which do not fit into either the elliptical or spiral categories. Irregular galaxies lack any of the common forms and are usually characterized by chaotic connections, stellar clusters, and sometimes lack a distinct shape or pronounced center. They are relatively rare and make up approximately 5% of the total number of known galaxies. The reason why irregular galaxies differ so significantly from their galactic counterparts lies in the likelihood that each of these stellar systems was likely once an elliptical or spiral galaxy, but something disrupted their formation process or structure, leading to their irregular appearance. Such galaxies are mainly divided into two types, those that have some resemblance to a structure allowing them to be classified into certain sequences of galaxies and those that do not even have a semblance. There is also a third type known as dwarf irregular galaxies, characterized by a low amount of heavy elements and a large amount of interstellar gas, making them similar to the galaxies of the early universe. Hence, studying this type of irregular galaxies is crucial for understanding the process of galactic evolution. Moreover, in these galaxies, one can observe young, hot stars. They contain a significant amount of dust that blocks much of the light from the stars. It is likely that such galaxies have planets where the sky appears rather modest and dull. Personally, I would not recommend observing them through a telescope. Bright examples of such galaxies are NGC 1427A or the Magellanic Clouds. As for the galaxies that possess certain characteristics but cannot be categorized into any of the aforementioned classes, they are referred to as peculiar galaxies. Their structural features can vary, such as distorted structures due to interactions with neighboring galaxies, the presence of dust lanes, ejections of matter, and so on. A classic example of a peculiar galaxy is the radio galaxy NGC 5128. In the past, Pluto was considered the ninth planet of the solar system, and astronomers actively discussed the hypothesis of a tenth planet. However, when Pluto was later demoted, astronomers began searching for the ninth planet once again. If the ninth planet truly exists, where is it and what kind of planet is it? What do we currently know about it? Let's get started. The Planet X. Problems related to Uranus and Pluto. After the discovery of Neptune, the question of whether there exists a giant planet beyond Neptune's orbit troubled researchers. When you think about it, Everything originated from the orbit of Uranus. It didn't match the calculations that were possible at the time, and this discrepancy led to the discovery of Neptune. However, it was soon realized that the mass of Neptune did not match the mass that would have been exerted by Uranus. The most diligent explorer of the planets beyond Neptune's orbit, that is, the entire outer solar system, was Percival Lowell. He searched and wandered for a long time, and in the end, didn't glimpse it, but left behind many valuable calculation results. After Lowell passed away in 1916, his calculations seemed to be fading away. In 1930, Clyde Toombaugh discovered Pluto, which was initially considered a very large celestial body, 
According to the initial calculations, Pluto had a diameter of about 8,000 kilometers, and its mass was similar to that of Mars. If an object of this size had mutual gravitational interactions, combined with the gravitational interaction of Neptune, it could explain the shape of Uranus's orbit. The enigmatic planet appeared to have been discovered, but not everything ended smoothly. The accurate mass of Pluto was constantly updated, and it even decreased each time. After the discovery of its moon, Charon, in 1978, researchers finally found the final value. As a result, Pluto turned out to have a mass smaller than not only Uranus, but even some large moons in the solar system. Even the moon itself had six times the weight of Pluto. So, the mystery of an unknown planet blocked the path of researchers, and many of them returned to what Lowell was doing 70 years ago. At that time, the existence of Planet X was evident, and many researchers believed it had been confirmed by calculations. The rest was just waiting for its discovery. Some researchers speculated that the planet they were looking for would have a mass similar to that of Mars and would be in the same region as Pluto. Other researchers guessed that the planet would have a much larger mass than Mars, but would be much farther from Pluto. Either way, they continued to uncover the entire enigma through numerous discussions. Researchers from both sides were greatly disappointed when Voyager 2 reached Neptune in 1989, and, based on the data collected by the probe in 1992, the mass of Neptune was recalculated based on the data. Researchers were greatly disappointed. It was found that there was an error of about 0.5%, and that happened to be the mass of Mars. It was the remaining piece of the puzzle, the mysterious planet. With the accurate mass of Neptune known, researchers recalculated the gravitational effect of Neptune on Pluto's orbit. Surprisingly, the anomalies disappeared. The calculated results matched the actual observed results, indicating that there was no need to consider a tenth planet. Thus, Lowell's hypothetical planet problem was resolved, but our story doesn't end here. New discoveries and new problems arose. In the years following the demotion of Pluto, the ninth planet wasn't a topic that readily came up among researchers. However, as time passed, more and more was learned. It's too early to conclude the story. In 1992, the exploration of the entire outer solar system began, revealing that the solar system doesn't end with Pluto. The most notable discovery among the newly found objects was Sedna, a dwarf planet with a diameter of about 1,000 kilometers. It had a highly eccentric orbit. The passage of time on Sedna during one rotation around the Sun is slightly shorter than 11,500 years. During its long journey, Sedna moves more than 900 astronomical units away from the Sun and gets as close as 76 astronomical units. The long elliptical orbit is not known to exist apart from the known comets. Another notable dwarf planet with a significant difference between its perihelion and aphelion distances was discovered, 2012 VP113. It moves about 446,000 astronomical units away from the Sun and gets as close as 80.6 astronomical units. Researchers have proposed various hypotheses to explain the factors that greatly elongate and distort the orbits of these dwarf planets. According to one theory, the Sun may have an unknown brown dwarf or a dark red dwarf as a partner celestial body. The distance between that star and the Sun could be very large, and we may not know exactly what kind of star it is. A good example that demonstrates the existence of such a star is Proxima Centauri, the closest neighbor to Earth in the Centaurus constellation. This star orbits around the binary stars Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, located more than 12,000 astronomical units away from them. The hypothesis of an unknown partner star for the Sun is quite intriguing, and if you're interested, we can explore it further in another discussion. But for now, let's return to the hypothesis of a distant planet that can explain the peculiar elliptical orbits. In 2014, based on the calculations, researchers reached the conclusion that there is no unknown celestial body within a radius of 26,000 astronomical units from the Sun with a mass comparable to or larger than Jupiter, or a celestial body with a radius of 10,000 kilometers comparable to Saturn. However, there is still room for smaller objects with masses below that of Neptune. According to calculations by researchers, 
there may be a planet with two or three times the mass of Earth orbiting around 500 astronomical units away from the Sun. If the mass of this object is larger, equivalent to 15 Earths, the distance from the Sun would be around 1,000 astronomical units. In both cases, considering the potential influence of smaller objects, the actual observational results can be explained. In the same year, astronomers noticed that six dwarf planets, including Sedna and 2012 VP1 and 3, in the outer regions of the solar system, orbit more than 250 astronomical units away from the Sun, have similar orbital characteristics, and move in nearly the same direction in space. This suggests that these objects are being shepherded by some celestial body and influenced by its gravity. However, despite all this, the enigmatic planet has not yet been discovered. Researchers speculate that this planet may be very dark. Interestingly, a similar hypothesis existed for Pluto as well. Astronomers considered the possibility that Pluto might be larger than expected. Recently, Chinese astronomers made a novel proposal. Instead of searching for the planet itself, they suggested looking for its satellites. An object with that mass could attract celestial bodies of about 200 kilometers in size from the scattered disk or the outer cloud, at least 20 of them. Such objects can be observed if the location is known. If successful, it would be an unprecedented event where the satellite of a celestial body is discovered before the body itself. With this, today's video comes to an end. My hypothetical planet would probably have a dark and dim appearance. If its mass is similar to Earth's, its surface would be solid and completely covered in ice. In the planet's sky, the sun would appear small, similar in size to other stars. There would be hardly any brightness greater than that of a full moon visible from Earth. The surface would be covered with frozen gases like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, or methane. There would be no significant heat transfer to melt the ice from the sun. If my hypothetical planet were a giant planet like Neptune, it is difficult to even imagine what kind of celestial body it would be. So we can only hope for new discoveries in the future.